And uh, we want to get right into this as uh, we dismiss for Children's Church and uh, all those ministries that take place after second service here. If you're a visitor here again this morning, we want to welcome you. Let's welcome all our visitors again. I do want to say that if you're a visitor, especially a first-time visitor, you just happen to come in to our annual, everybody say annual, annual, annual uh, stewardship sermon series. I do one a year, and uh, uh, what I'd love to share with you is what I shared with the whole church last week, and I want to reiterate again to you this week. Oftentimes when we come to a stewardship sermon series, we think, well, the preacher and the elders are ministering on this because uh, the church needs the money. Uh, And, you know, ongoing looking at budgets and things like that, part of that is true. But in the sense that God has blessed us in a way that's incredible this year, the first year in our 21-year history or whatever coming up in October, this is the first year that every month in the year we have met the budget. Let's go ahead and give God praise for that. Right? So these sermon series never come out of need. They come out of principle because the Scripture teaches us how to deal with finances. That being said, there is ongoing ministries and things that happen because of your faithfulness. And and a lot of that we can see before our very eyes. Um, And those things, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, if it wasn't for the church's faithfulness, there'd be no way that VBS could be put on at the magnitude and the quality that it's put on every year. And I'm extremely grateful for that. Amen? Amen? Like, that's so good. What What was your budget this year for VBS? So it, so the church right now, and that's not enough, really. No. But we, we budgeted this year to spend $8,000 on VBS for a week of ministry and outreach. It's incredible, uh, and it keeps growing and growing, and I anticipate that it will keep growing because we value ministry in the kids' lives, and uh, it's such an incredible way. And, and last year, how many kids did we have? 230. So... Yeah, so 240 kids, you know, running around here every night is insane. But uh, I just want you to know, tomorrow is an off day for staff. And and the week of VBS, nothing's going on during the day either. So uh, everything's going on at night. Uh, I'll promise you, you'll get all the counseling you need if you just come and help us with VBS. Amen. Yeah, Yeah, and that's another good thing. What you might not know is that the Kalamazoo Church comes all the way from Kalamazoo every night during VBS and helps us. And so they give us money out of their budget. What did they commit to it this year? So they gave 500 toward. I mean, it's incredible what our church plant is doing. Amen? And so let's give God praise for that too. So much going on, so much of the goodness of God. And so I want to approach this with our hearts postured properly as we go into what I want to work on when I say habits. And those things. Um, uh, you know, I want to preference the scripture that I'm going to read this morning with. Uh, in Florida, where I grew up, we got any people from Florida? From Florida? Not from, you're not from Florida. Eddie's raising his hand for everything. I could say, are you two years old? And Eddie raised, no. Uh, Florida. All right. In Florida, where I grew up, we have a different kind of ant down there than Michigan has. Uh, in, in Florida, where I grew up, we have these little bitty ants, and for lack of better word, or, or let's just keep it uh, PG this morning, we call them fire ants, because uh, when they bite you, it feels like fire. Um, and uh, there's other words for them, but uh, we're preaching a sermon this morning, so we'll leave it at that. But these little bitty ants are incredible creatures. Uh, I mean, they're so faithful, they're so steady, and they're so focused at what they do. In the evening, you can go to bed with your yard just completely flat after you have mowed it and it manicured. And you can get up in the morning with an ant heel knee high. Those guys have worked all night. These little bitty tiny things. And you can kick that ant heel over and just millions of ants will pour out of that instantly to start to repair it. And just a couple of hours, they'll have it fixed. We used to do some European type mounts for animals that we would, when we went hunting, that we would harvest on our hunting trips. And, and we'd want the, the skulls completely cleaned off and all. We'd do our best to clean it off. But what we'd do is we'd go over, take that skull, and we'd kick that ant heel open on the top, and we'd put that skull right on the top of it. And you come back in a week with your shovel and dig down and dig it out, and it would completely be clean. Those ants had worked that hard. They are hard working little creatures, they're steadfast. They're focused and they're steady. Watch this. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. 
which having no captain, overseer, or ruler, provides her supply in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. How long will you slumber, little sluggard? When will you rise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall your poverty come on you like a prowler and your need like an armed man. Father, bless the reading of the word to the hearing of our ear and the receiving of our heart in Jesus' name. And everyone said... Now, like the last part of that verse, it's incredible. We get the picture of the ant like nobody's business because we know that they are steady. They're steadfast. They're incredible. They can overcome great obstacles. We've seen them. We've, I've seen them build a bridge over water so that the rest of them can crawl. I've seen them build a ladder from one limb to the other using their bodies as others would crawl across them. It's incredible what the ant does. He's incredibly focused, incredibly faithful at what he does. I love the last part of this verse when it says, your need will come like an armed man. Have you ever had a need kind of surprise you like that? Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Like you, you go along, you're just doing fine, everything is fine, and all of a sudden a need just pops up like a, ro a robber with a gun and just steals something from you. Maybe, maybe you've had a little extra money and you've, you've put some money towards something somewhere or, or you've, just, you've been saving and you've been saving and you've been saving to buy something that you wanted. You start an envelope system, right? You had to, this need or this desire you wanted and you saved up for it. And as soon as you went and bought it, on the way home, something broke. Yep. And you just spent your money. Hello, somebody. Yep. Come on, am I the only one who's been there? No. I mean, like a robber, it just shows up and, you know... The washing machine breaks down. The car breaks down. What's going on? All these things take place. Because that's the way financial troubles happen. Yep. That's the way it happens. So there's got to be some principles. There's got to be some way to overcome what we like to call Murphy's Law, which is nothing more than just the devil. Let me give you the good news. You ready? Here's some good news. The good news and the bad news. Let me get it. You ready? Recently, American households have paired their debt from $12.5 trillion to $11.6 trillion. Recently, American households have pared their debt down a trillion dollars. That's the good news. Amen? Here's the bad news. Most of that came because of home foreclosures and defaults on credit cards. Good news. 89% of Americans say they're watching their expenditures. Hello, somebody. Bad news. Spending has ballooned in certain areas. Are you ready? Cell phone equipment. It's a good business to be in. You want me to tell you why? Because even though 90% of Americans say they're watching their expenditures, do you know that spending on cell phone equipment is up 16.6%? Got to have those dongles. And the dangler. Got to have... Listen, we went into a Mac store in, uh, in Fort Wayne. My wife and I took off one day. We went to Fort Wayne, and, and, and we just needed to get away for a day. It was on a Saturday, and, and we, we wanted to leave town. And so if anybody called us, we could say, sorry, we're not in town, because we weren't. We were in Fort Wayne. But anyway, we were, we were down there, and we walked into a Mac store. And sure enough, these guys, you know, they're selling dongles, but they'd never seen a dongle dangler. And so I showed them my dongle dangler, and they were like, dude, that is epic. And right away, they're on the computer ordering them for the store to sell. It's like, I should get some fee of this. You know, so I should get the, something out of it. 89% of Americans say they're watching their expenditures, yet cell phone expense is up 16.6%. 89% of Americans, good news, say they're watching their expenditures, yet pet expenses are up 14.4%. Here's something even worse compared in the same time frame. 89% of Americans say they're watching their expenditures and child care, even though pet care is up 14.4%, child care is only up 12.8%. From the start of the recession... We've all thought, okay, let's cut back, let's cut back, let's cut back. But impulse buying is still prevalent. 
Runaway spending happens all the time. It's those J-hooks in that store. It's that aisle. It's right there. It's that, it's that gondola on the end of the aisle that gets you. It's standing in the checkout register. You know, let me tell you why Walmart has 500 registers and only two open. They want to give you time to stand in front of that stuff to impulse buy. Don't t- no, they do it. I know they do it because I was in the business. That's why they do it. You, you, there's five main items in the grocery store. Milk, eggs, bananas, bread, and meat. And if you will understand the next time you go into the grocery store, those five items are strategically placed in the four corners of the grocery store to make you walk around the whole grocery store to get those five items. I, I was there for 20 years. I know. That's why we did it. Those are the things that happen. It's called impulse buying. It gets you. It's right there, right? So like all of it is setting there. All of, it's, all of it's incredible. I'd have a nice roast display and the produce guy would come over and put baby carrots and potatoes next to my roast. Yes, he would. You got to have it. Right there. Runaway spending happens. Let me give you an illustration first. Uh, a, a lady by the name of Maria Diaz. She's 30 years old. She was a waitress. She was forced to move in with her mother. She said this. She said, I keep waiting for things to get better, and they just don't. And after a while, I just decided, forget it. I need some new clothes, and I'm going to go get them. Even though I live with my mom, I'm going to go get it. My mom's not happy, but I don't care. My philosophy is if you stop spending, you stop living. Hello, somebody. Let me give you another, another. here's the second one, right? Uh, a gentleman by the name of Harry Dugan, his 50-year-old respiratory therapist, probably makes a pretty good living, right? He's a respiratory therapist from New Jersey, and although he's underwater on his mer- mortgage, he tried to, to cut back on his expenses, and he had a bit of a relapse, and he said, you know what? My TV broke, so I went out and bought a $1,000 television and a $21,000 car in the same afternoon because I was mad that my TV broke. If I could go back and do it, I'd do something different. You see, a life simplified gets a handle on finances and material wealth. Somebody say amen. A life simplified gets a handle on these things. And that is important. It doesn't let us handle, it doesn't let, we don't let it handle us. We get a handle on it. See, wealth and possessions are meant to be a gift from God. Watch Ecclesiastes, right? Everyone also whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toy. This is a gift from God. Rejoice in his toil. If you work hard, God says it's a gift. Here's things because you work of it. Listen, wealth is of great value in the world that we live in. Nothing gets done, good or bad, without it. Come on. Nothing gets produced. Nothing gets passed on to the next generation. No business, no business starts without wealth in the world. But the truth of the matter is wealth can distract us from God. Can you say amen? Amen. Keep falsehoods and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal and dishonor the name of my God. Wealth can distract us from God. Ultimately, wealth is limited in its value. That's why Jesus says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. It is limited in its value. Why? Because it is so limited in its value that moth and rust and thieves destroy it. That's how limited it is. And so the book of Proverbs is teaching us an incredible thing about acquiring wealth and its blessings. So no one that comes to to wealth in this issue doesn't understand the practical and the moral issues to it. There's something very moral about the way we spend our money. Or immoral. So let me give you some principles quick this morning inside of all of this. Are you ready? I got one person who's ready. She's already heard it this morning, so she's... (laughs) Number one, honor God. Give generously. Honor God. Give generously. I looked for a video on it. I couldn't find it. I want to show you a video on it. Last week I showed you uh, uh, an NFL quarterback who had some statements to say about it. But this, year, this week I, I was reading about uh, the Tennessee Titans center. And his name is Ke- Kevin Long. And he played his college uh, football under Bobby Bowden at Florida State. If you're an ACC fan, you probably know about 
Bobby Bowden. If you're not an ACC fan, your team probably got beat by Florida State at one time or another. We never liked we were, Anyway, T.C. used to be a big Florida State fan, and he moved to Michigan, and somebody converted him to that team over there, um, uh, the green team with the little funny guy. Yeah, yeah. They said, tell us your favorite story about Bobby Bowden. He said, you know what I love about Bobby Bowden? You know what I loved about playing for Bobby Bowden? Every game, he would inspire us with a parable of his own life. He would come into the locker room, and he would inspire us with a parable. And they said, what was the greatest one you ever heard him tell? He said, one night, one night before a game, he was encouraging us. We've got to do the basics. If we're going to win, we've got to do the basics. The flair and the flamboyance, it looks good on TV, it, but it doesn't win games. The basics win the games. If we fail to do the basics on the football field, we will lose the game. For instance, let me tell you a story. Bobby said to his team, he said, when I was in college, I played college baseball. He said, I've never hit a home run my whole career. And one night, I got a hold of a ball just right. It went right down the right field line, and it went over the wall. My first home run I'd ever hit, right over the right field wall. Perfect. He said, I started trotting down. I, I rounded first, and I looked over to third, and everybody's clapping, and, and the coach is saying, yeah, it's a home run. Come on around. And I rounded second, looked at the coach. I went to third. The coach gave me a high five. I got to the, the home plate, and the team was out there, and they were all high-fiving me, and it was great. It was an epic, epic time. I'd hit my first home run ever in my career. Then the pitcher took the baseball. And he threw it to first base. And the umpire called me out. He looked at his team and he said, gentlemen, if you don't take care of first base, nothing else matters. If you don't touch first base, nothing else matters. You see, when I talk about honoring God, it's not because God is some ogre in heaven who's looking to demand something from us because we owe him something for what he did for us. That's not who God is. This idea of honoring God is looking at the basics in our life, to, be, to live our life in a way that's thankful. That's why Proverbs says, listen, gentlemen, listen, discipleship guys, this is a verse. You remember it? Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of your crops. Then your barns will be filled with overflowing and your vats and brims over with new wine. That's what God is saying. Now, honor is there. Let me tell you why I preach this, why I teach this, because I want you to know this beyond a shadow of a doubt. You might want to tweet it. You might want to Facebook it or even just take a picture of it. Giving breaks the power of money in your life. Giving breaks the fist of clutch and greed. Giving, giving. That's why Jesus says, don't lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Give, right? Give. That's where your heart is. That's where your treasure is. He's preaching to us. He's telling us about what it means to honor God in our lives. The first fruits of who we are. And so this first principle looks at God and says, I want to be like God. You're never more like God when you give. Come on. The Bible says, our famous scripture, right? For God so loved the world that he gave. We're never more like God than when we give. When we learn to posture our lives to be givers and not takers. We've all been in that place where we've had to receive. Yeah. Come on. And it's a difficult place to be in. I've been there. My wife and I have been there. I like being on the other side. I like hearing of a need and saying, hey, can we give to it? Can we give to it? Can we be a blessing in it? What can we do to it? I love that aspect of it. I love the fact that the mailboxes are back there. And that any time we can know that there's a family in need and anonymously we can just drop an envelope in there yeah. with a little bit of, uh, you know, blessing. And you just know, you never have, you'll never know how many times it happened to my wife and I early on in our life as, as new believers. We'd come home after a Sunday and open up our Bibles and someone had deposited giving because they knew of a need. It was incredible. I have no idea who did it. It was so, so they were honoring God and it caused us to see God in a way that we would never see him before. So giving is an incredible thing. Learn to give generously. How about this one? Stop chasing fantasies. Put some long-term goals to your life. Those who work, 
Those who work their land will have abundant food, but those who chase fantasies have no sense. Y'all not helping me. Those who work their land will have an abundant food, but those who chase fantasies will have their fill of poverty. Come on, Proverbs is speaking to us, right? It's kind of like the lottery. People tell me, oh, Pastor Don, when I hit the lottery, that church is going to be, that new building is going to be paid for. It's, it's, that's not the way God pays for new buildings. Do you understand that? That's not the, God doesn't work by happen chance. The kingdom of God doesn't operate by accident. No, God works by faithfulness, right? That's what God does. God works through faithfulness of long-term understanding and planning. People ask me all the time, Hey, Pastor Don, how come there's bricks out there on one side and just rock rocks on the other side? It kind of looks a little funny. See, as a leader, I have to think long-term. I know what the next building looks like connected to this one. Because we planned long-term. But I can only afford to build this one. So you got to look at stone and brick for a little while. Hello, somebody. When the new building gets up, then you'll see the rest of it blend in together. But right now we have to build. we got a long-term plan. And we've got to be faithful with what we've got. And so we've put it there. It always amazes me that the poor in our communities always seem to have money for lottery, tattoos, and cigarette. But they never have money for food. Am I the only one that's amazed by that? You know why? Because the lottery plays on them. It's an evil thing. Evil. I said it out loud. It's an evil thing. In 2010, Lehigh Valley Research Consortium, they released a report showing 48% of those people below the poverty line in Lehigh Valley intended to gamble at the Sands Casino in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. The casino ads always show young and glamorous working people in their gambling. But if you walk into the casino, what you see inside is something incredibly different. Hardworking or even poor in their gambling. Let me tell you something, church. There's always a trade-off between long-term and short-term. Somebody say amen or oh me, because that's the truth, right? So I press towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of Christ Jesus in my life. This is what I'm looking like. Like I'm setting some long-term goals in my finances. I'm understanding that I can't have everything that my parents worked 50 years for right away. Long-term goals are important. They're very important. Here's another one. Look here. So we've got to honor God. Stop chasing fantasies. We've got to deal with debt. You've got to avoid debt. We, we're, we keep telling the church, you got to, listen, you cannot be a giver if you're an ower. Is that a word? It is now. That's a PD-ism. I'll write a book one day of PD-isms. Can't be a giver if you're an ower. Proverbs says, then they will call to me, but I will not answer. Why? Because I'm, I'm in debt. That's where I'm at. Since they will call, but since they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord, since they would not accept my advice and, and spurned my rebuke, they'll eat the fruit of their ways and be filled with the fruit of their schemes. For their waywardness is simple. To, it will kill them, and complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear of harm. God is saying, because people don't listen to me about this issue, there's, there's trouble coming. Debt is an incredible... Let me give you PDs. Listen, I got, I got an infomercial. We made a few. I got some. Right? We're in Colorado. Uh, we're trying to light a charcoal grill out there. My brother lives about 8,000 feet. And uh, there's no air up there. You can't light a charcoal grill up there just won't light and so we got the uh shop back out and we turned it around we reversed the blower on it and we got a, a lighter in there where and we started blowing air into the bottom of the the grill to get the fire going because there was no oxygen up there right and so we, we made us an info commercial we're like somebody needs to build a grill fan grill fan three easy payments so 33.99 <laughs> do you live in colorado do you have trouble lighting your charcoal grill? I have the answer for you. Three easy payments of $33.99. You can have the grill fan. 
Let me give you another one. Get, get, life without debt, right? Yeah, I see it all the time. Life without debt. Here's mine. Fast money educational training course. Let me show you how to. I'm going to show you in my course how to compound $5 weekly into $780 weekly just to start. Then I'm going to show you how to compound $25 weekly into $3,900 weekly. Then I'm going to show you how to compound leverage your way to complete financial independence Eliminate your debt from creditors and banks. Simply print out this form, return this letter with $5 cash only in the envelope. Then I'm going to mail you my Life Without Death instruction guide and, and, and to your place. And there's going to be the envelope for you to place your $5 cash in there so that I can send you uh, how the plan works. Let me help you get an extra income path in your life without leaving the comfort of your home. Get started today by printing out this letter, complete the details below, and mail me $5 cash. You know what you're going to be out of? No, $5.50 because you got to put the stamp on it. I ain't paying for the stamp either. Hello, somebody. And all of them are the same. And they're all the same. The program's all about money, and it appeals to the masses. Why? Because debt always mortgages the future. It always mortgages the future. You can say amen or oh me because we've been there. It always mortgages the future. You're always paying for something in the future if you got debt now. You're always paying for it. And so that is an important principle in the scripture, right, to understand what we're doing for the future. We're mortgaging not the thing we want right now. We're actually mortgaging the future. What do we want life to look like individually? Let me ask this church, what do we want life to look like? And those are the things we have to ask ourselves. Here's one. This is a no-brainer. You'll be ready. You might want to buckle your seatbelt. It might hit you pretty hard. Spend less than you learn, earn. That might be an incredible revelation, but every success in your financial life will depend on this habit. True? True? Every success in your financial life will depend on this habit, this habit of learning to live within your means. That's great, right? One person pretends to be rich, yet has nothing, and another person pretends to be poor, yet has great wealth. Proverbs 12, 9, better to be a nobody and yet have a servant than pretend to be somebody and have no food. Y'all helping me? Let me give you five signs here. You're likely living beyond your means. Are you ready? I'm meddling now, aren't I? Come on. Pastor Don's meddling. Pastor Don's meddling. Brace yourself. Here's a sign that you might be living be- uh, uh, above your means. Your credit score is below 600. See, the credit score runs from 300 to low uh, to 850 high, I believe. And this is what people look at, the lenders look at, to see if you're actually living within your means. They compare your debt-to-income ratio, and they find this out. The score lenders use to determine whether they're going to grant you a loan. In general, any credit score below 600 means you're probably over your head. Number two, you're saving less than 5%. You mean you want me to save 5% of my annual income? At least. Listen to me, church. Now, I know what you're thinking. Wow, not only do you want me to give 10% of my annual gross income, now you're asking me to save 5% of my gross income. Pastor Don, that's 15%. I only got 85% to live on. Okay. In 2006, the average rate of personal saving was astonishing. In 2006, the average rate rate of personal savings was an astonishing negative 0.5%. That means not only were we spending all of our income, but we're also a good number of us dipping into personal savings or credit cards. That's the worst saving rates that America have had has had since 1933 when it was negative 0.5%. 7%, and that was during the Great Depression. The only time that it's been worse was during the Great Depression, and we literally weren't that far away from it in 2006. 
Now, the rate bounced back in 2018 or 2008 and climbed further in 2009, but it's still under 1%. It's not up to 1% yet. And so, if you're saving less than 5% of your income, investing and, and, and trying to get it to grow and doing those things, then, then you might be living beyond your means. Your credit card balance is arising. This is a no-brainer, right? Yeah. Buying on credit and paying installment has become a national pastime. It's more famous than baseball. Yep. It's much easier to buy a new flat screen TV. It's, it's so easy to buy. No, three installments. Easy, I forgot. Three easy installments. Yeah. What's another $50 a month, right? right. Stuff so starts nickel and diming us right into bankruptcy. If your income is being sliced and diced away for dozens of unnecessary installment purchases, you're probably living beyond your means. There's a sense that when one lives beyond their means, things have become bigger than God. God said this to Abraham. You remember this? He said to Abraham, Abraham, I am thy exceeding great reward. I'm all you need. Come on. In Proverbs, he's intimate with the upright. In 1 Timothy, godliness with contentment is great gain. Number four. You ready? It's pretty powerful. If your house payment, including your insurance and your taxes, are more than 28%, you're probably in a house you cannot afford. Well, I'm meddling, aren't I? You guys are quiet. First server wasn't so quiet. Come on, help me out here. Why is 28% the magic number? Historically, conservative lenders have used 28% to say this is the rate we know that people, if they owe 28%, they can live reasonably on the rest. So now we're at 28% of our income is going to our mortgage, 10% is going in tithe, and 5% is going into savings. Hello, somebody. And Pastor Donna hadn't even talked about taxes yet. Come on, good. Number five, your bills are spiraling out of control. Who's ever been there? Yep. Come on, I remember when, when uh, one of the stores that I was working for uh, decided to close the store and they had to move employees around. There wasn't, I was a, a market manager at that time. And um, uh, they didn't have any place to put me, and they were going to demote me from a market manager down to a meat cutter. I was going to lose pay. So I, I decided to, all right, now's the time to make a career change. And I, some guys in the insurance company, uh, corporation, decided to hire me to sell insurance. They said, hey, you're a preacher. You love to talk. You're going to be a great insurance salesman. Just talk to people. You'll see how stop. But see, I wasn't very good at selling insurance. Matter of fact, I wasn't, not only was I not very good, I was down route terrible. Selling insurance, I, I just struggled. Like, I believe in insurance, right? But it is terrible to, har- it's hard to sell somebody something they can't see. Yeah. Do you believe in insurance? You should believe in insurance. People ask me all the time, you know, what about car insurance or whatever? My wife and I carry full coverage insurance on both our vehicles, whether they're paid for or not. That's the key, because I'm going to hit a deer. <laughs> we live in Michigan, people. Right, come on. You're going to hit a deer. You're going to crunch him? You're not in the insurance? You're not going to have a car? And you can't haul him home to eat him? Yeah. It's foolish not to, I mean, for the cost versus the benefit. I'm like, yeah, it's paid for it. I believe in insurance. I couldn't sell it. I could not sell it. I'm just telling you, I couldn't sell it. I, I was doing so bad, finally the boss man pulled me into his office and he said, look here, Don. He said, either you're going to be a salesman. You're going to sell insurance? Are you going to sell your car? Are you going to sell your house? Are you going to sell, you, but you're going to sell something. I promptly went back to cutting meat because I knew I could make it. I can make money cutting meat. This is it, right? If our bills were spiling out of control because I wasn't making an income and nothing was worse than coming home, working hard all week long and not being able to bring a check home for my family. That was terrible. Bills were spiling out of control. We've been there. We had to learn after that. Listen, we got to make some serious adjustments. We can't keep living this way. These are five signs. Maybe you like them, maybe you don't. But let's get back to our principles here. Number five, start saving for the future. I had a guy, we were, Derek Wallace and I were leading a, a men's homeless shelter in Chipley, Florida, there before I came to Michigan. 
And, uh, you know, once or twice a week we were over doing Bible studies with the homeless guys in the shelter or whatever. And one of these guys had gotten super spiritual, and, and he had a super spiritual hat on one night. And he thought he'd give me a lecture about my 401K. He said, you don't, you don't practice what you preach. I said, what are you talking about? He said, don't you preach that Jesus could come back at any minute? Yes. Do you have a 401K? Yes. Well, then you're living like Jesus might not come back. I said, No. If Jesus comes back today, I am prepared to go with him. But if Jesus doesn't come back today, I am getting prepared to serve him tomorrow. So I'm saving for the future. Right? But you got to plan for financial margin. The unexpected is going to happen. The wash machine's going to break. Come on. The car's going to break. The kids are going to get sick. It's what kids do. They eat dirt and they get sick. It's what they do. It's what happens. It's the nature of stuff to break. But it's not our nature because we haven't been biblically trained to handle our finances to plan for the margin. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? These are, it's so important to think about this. Looking at the future. Listen, the Bible says the wise store up choice food and olive oil. Olive oil is good. Choice food? I'm not talking about, listen, I'm not talking about uh, worm-eating apples. I'm talking about the best apples. Are you with me? Choice food. I'm not talking about ground beef. I'm talking about prime rib. Yeah, picanha from... I'm telling you, from Brazil, we're talking about the good stuff. All of, but fools gulp us down. Yeah. A good person leaves on an inheritance for their children. But a sinner's wealth is stored up for the. Listen to this. I, I was driving there, I saw a bumper sticker that says, I'm spending my children's inheritance. I thought, it made me angry because I thought, why? Why would we do that? Why? I grew up poor. You know, there's a lot of people in this world who are banking their future on the inheritance they get from their parents. And, and I'm glad that some people are in that position. I'm not. I grew up poor. My family has nothing and still has nothing. And my wife and I had to think about this. Listen, when our parents die, we're, not getting, we're probably going to get the funeral bill. And we have started financially thinking about those particular areas. I'm going to have to pay for the funeral. And we've started saying, we've got a plan for this. It's going to happen. I'm going to have to do it. But I don't want my children to go through that. And we've planned that also. Our will is established. It's in the safe. It's written out. And it's divided. Everything is set up all for the kids so that we're not spending our kids' inheritance. I'm giving my kids something to live on so they can serve God in that. And so, yeah, I'm planning. I'm planning to leave a legacy for them as much as I can. See, let me tell you something, church. Saving money is not a matter of math. It's not like you get to the end of the budget and and math adds up and, and now we've got a little extra and we'll save that. No, you won't. No, you won't. You won't save it. If you're not telling your budget according to the Ramsey plan to have a zero-based budget, every month our budget zeroes out. We tell every penny what to do, including savings. Every penny is told what to do. All of that is in there. Savings is not a matter of math. Savings is a matter of yes. This is what we're doing. You're not going to save money when you get that raise. I'm going back. I remember when I first got promoted to market manager, it was a great deal. You know, the thing was going up, and I was going to get a nice big raise in salary, plus bonuses were coming. And I remember signing the contract, and my boss man shaking my hand and said, Congratulations, you worked for 11 years for this. You're ready to go. Take your wife out to dinner. I said, Not only am I taking my wife out to dinner, but I'm going to take my wife down and buy new furniture. You know what we did? We financed the furniture. You know what happened? I didn't get a raise. I didn't get a raise. I got debt. Do you understand that? What came as a raise in my salary instantly went to somebody else. That was foolish. You're not going to save money when you get a raise. You're not going to save money when the car's paid off. You're not going to save money when the kids are grown. You're only going to save money when you become emotionally tired of being broke. Tired of it. 
What's the secret to saving them, Pastor Don? Well, I'm glad you asked. Focused discipline. Remember the ant. See, discipline keeps us doing what we need to be doing when emotion wears off. If it becomes too emotional, it becomes greed. And whether we have too, middle, too, too much or too little, all of it's there. And I've witnessed this many times in people's life. And the, You know, the most miserable people I've met in my life are the greediest. Yep. They are. They're the greediest. And so my encouragement to you as a church, as we talk about this in our own finances personally, stay focused, work your plan, make it happen. Yep. It's biblical. It's, it's best time to start right now when you ain't got no money. Proverbs, a discerning person keeps wisdom in view, but a fool's eyes wanders to the end of the earth. Plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. Hello, somebody. Plans are established by seeking advice. If you wage war, obtain guidance. You've got to go to war against this stuff in your life. Yeah. How about Proverbs 15? Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors they succeed. This is so good, isn't it? This is so good. So my question to us today is, what's next? Man, you asked some really good, right? Yeah. Confess your need to God. We all need help yeah. in our finances. And this church, this eldership team has decided that our, our vision that God has given us in little old Centerville is so big that we need to make sure that not only is the financial health of this church good, but the financial health of its members need to be good. And so we have invested money and time to send leaders across the country to go to school to become certified financial counselors. This kind of counseling that you would have to pay hundreds of dollars an hour for is free to you as a church member. Why don't you use it? There are certified counselors. They, they're ready to help you prepare to be a blessing. They're ready to help you be a blessing. All you've got to do is ask, right? So confess your need to God. How can we get it, right? Recommit your finances to him. Here's what's going to happen, God. We're going to seek you first. We're going to put it there. We're going to seek the counsel that God's put around us. We're going to create a plan, and then we're going to get started. Start today. Start today. I told you last week, it's as e tithing is as easy as trusting God for a dime on a dollar. Yep. It's not that difficult. 5% of savings is even less than that. We look at these things that are happening, and, and so we begin to plan for the margin what looks like it. Here's, here's the thing that I love about our church ministry. Backyard ministry, all these things like this offering today is so great. Find a need and say, we can meet that need. Find a need and say, we can meet that need because it's there. I remember counseling with a young couple who was having some marriage problems and they were having some financial problems. They usually go hand in hand. And I remember inside of there, it was several years back, uh, you know, they were, they, were, they were just struggling. They didn't have a washer and dryer. It, it had all broken down, and it was, it was one of those things. And, and they were going to leave our meeting for our marriage counseling meeting. They were going to go out, and they were going to finance washers and dryers. I said, don't do that. Give me just a second. I got on Facebook, and I said, hey, is anybody in our family? And in 15 minutes, a need was met. Yeah. Just like that. A need was met. Just like that, we were able to show up at their house and say, Jesus hadn't forgotten you. This is the way it works. Let the family be a blessing, right? You know, that's incredible to me. Those are incredible. And I can't tell you how many. We did that with Rob and Melody with Backyard Ministries, a, another need in the family. Somebody needed a washer and dryer. We just took it over there. We didn't know those people. We just said, Jesus loves you. Because someone had it. Our refrigerators and freezers have happened the same way. Then the, the finance team came to us one day and said, Pastor Don, we got an idea. Let, we, we, someone has donated a car. We want to put some money into it and maybe find a single mom and, and, and give it to them. Or, or find a way to bless them inside of it. How many, how many cars have we done that way now? Can you guess? Over 20 cars in the last few years. This car is given away to needy families. This little old place. Who does that? That's insane. There's one sitting out there now. Don't get in line. It's already given away, okay? <laughs> 
this is what we can do when we get our money right, church. And we can do more of it. Do you understand that? Single moms, needy families, we can show up and be the people of God in the community to impact the community because we've got our giving right, because we've got in our our sense our finances right. We've decided to be a blessing. We've decided that. We've decided beforehand that I'm going to be a blessing. I'm going to be a blessing. It's an incredible, incredible opportunity that this church has. And I'm just telling you, it is because of your faithfulness. Let me encourage you. It is because of your faithfulness and your giving that the eldership team was so brave as to build that building over there. 1.5 million. That's a lot of money, church. And, and, And it often keeps me up at night. You wonder why I got heartburn. I tell my wife all the time, you're stressing me out. Just don't, I'm stressed, don't stress me out, right? I'm stressed out over this, right? And the, the sanctuary, everything's going to change around here. We're going to continue to use this to disciple, to do school of ministry, to plant churches. All of these are our visions, and that has to take committed people saying, we believe in the vision so much that we put our money where our belief is. Why? Because behavior follows. It's true. Watch what happens. And, and do you understand that because of the faithfulness of this church, that when we planted out a church, that it, it doesn't happen this way. It was self-supporting from day one. And it's been that way ever since. And it's growing. And things are happening. And it's so much that they're coming home. And they're being a blessing to us. Yep. They're being a blessing to us. And it, I love that aspect of it. You should be excited about that aspect. It's so important for us as a church to grab a hold of this. And it all starts with just basically believing God for a dime on a dollar in our own life. Doesn't it? Yeah, yeah it does. It does. And, and I want to encourage you in that way. This is not a legalistic sermon. This is about doing the kingdom of God. It's about being God's people. And knowing that God is using us. And look, people ask me all the time, Pastor Don, how in the world are you guys doing it? And I said, I'm just continually amazed, not only by God's faithfulness, but by the faithfulness of his people. They just blow me away. They just blow me away. The ability to do those things. Amen? And I want you to be encouraged by that. I want you to be so encouraged and so excited about it that you're ready to do my homework. This week, I want you to take a look at your money plan, and I want you to assess your strengths and your weaknesses on these five issues that we've talked about today. The issue of giving generously. Where are you at? Where are you at? It's so much fun to give. And you know what? I love it when my wife and I can go out to eat together, and we've got our tip pre-planned, and we can give the waitress a tip up front. Why? Because, see, it's not, about, it's not about being served. It's about being a blessing. And I guarantee you, you tip up front and don't be cheap. Tip more than three bucks. Come on, somebody. You will never get bad service. People tell me all the time, oh, what if I get bad service? See, you're, you're figuring, you're trying to pay for something instead of being a blessing. Be a blessing first. Your tea glass will never get empty. I'm telling you what, I go to the Texas Roadhouse and we tip up front. My tea glass never gets, and I intend, for, I don't want it to get. Bring me the sweet tea. Bring the whole carton out here. Put a garden hose on it. And don't forget the rolls. Bring those dudes too. Just pull the oven over here as soon as they come out. I just. I'm just telling you, we used to do that as a ball team. Remember, we'd take up, before we go into like Pizza Hut one time, I remember when in Pizza Hut, we were playing a ball tournament somewhere. I don't know where we were traveling back. And we decided to stop at Pizza Hut and eat. And every guy in the, in the, in the, the bus gave like five bucks. And I don't know, we had like 20. Anyway, it was like 100 bucks we had when we walked in and we told the waitress, this is for you. Thanks for being a blessing. I'm telling you what, she didn't wait on another table all night long. But it's that mentality in our life where you're at giving generously. Set long-term goals. Are you weak or strong? Avoid debt. Avoid debt. Avoid debt like the plague. 
spend less than you earn. Where you at? You're weak or strong? Plan for financial margin. It's going to happen. Murphy's going to stick his ugly head up, and he looks like the devil. I'm telling you. I know what he looks like. If, I, if the devil's got it, it's Murphy. Murphy. It's going to happen. These are just some principles. Will you stand with me for a moment? I hope you'll take them to heart. I hope you'll grab a hold of them in your own life. In your own life. Now, these are synopsis of, of uh, you know, 13, 14 week course of Financial Peace University. Some of those things are just trying to wow, play it down in four weeks here for you. But it's so good. So we got two more weeks left. Whew. And it's going to be good, right? It's going to be good. Father, we bless you. Thank you for your hand of provision upon us. In this church, Lord, we have all we need. We have you. The resources that you have given us. And so, Lord, first of all, we want to thank you for your presence with us. Second of all, we want to thank you that you resource where you live. So, Lord, thank you for your provision. I pray for us as a family that you would continue Encourage us about our personal finance because we can do more together than we can do separate. And together, through our financial aspects of our life, we want the world to see you high and lifted up. Lord, let us be the answer to the community, not politics, not government, not laws. Let the community look to us for answers. And we pray that through our faithfulness, we'll continue to have resources to meet the needs that you lay before us. We pray it in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise. Thanks for coming. Turn around and tell somebody you love them in Jesus' name.